If you're struggling to get the perfect bass tone that sounds as good as your favorite bassist, you're not alone. I've been gigging for over 20 years, playing everything from ska, to jazz, to funk, to progressive Celtic rock. Yes, that's a thing. Sometimes it felt like my tone was super locked in and I felt confident with my playing and had fun. Other times my tone just felt off. I didn't know how to fix it and it was frustrating and kind of embarrassing. Why did Jamerson's tone sound so rich and smooth, but mine sounded harsh and thin? Why did Getty's sound so powerfully aggressive, but mine sounded weak and dull? So I started trying to fix it, but it actually made things worse. Dozens of videos with the same old just pluck properly advice. Pull across. Pull across. Pull across. Endless forum threads sending me down the rabbit hole of gear acquisition syndrome. Nothing helped, just more frustrating tone and an empty wallet. But then one night I was out on a gig and I happened to see the sound engineer wearing this t-shirt that I ordered just for this sentence that I'm saying right now, the seven bad system dwarves of the frequency spectrum. I was curious and little did I know that these dwarves would end up being the solution to my tone problems. See, sound engineers have learned to master the whole sound spectrum to make shit sound good. It's literally their job to turn bad mixes into good mixes and bad bass tones into good bass tones. So it turns out that five of these seven dwarves represent parts of the sound spectrum relevant to bass guitar and will create either tone solutions or tone problems. I mean, have you ever flicked your bass amp on, plucked one note, Whoa. and you feel a god-awful rumble shaking the stage, drowning out the kick drum? Ooh. This is Tubby the Dwarf kicking your ass. A nice balanced rock-ish bass signal might sound like this. But let Tubby the Dwarf control you and you'll get speaker blowing gut shaking that you can't even really imagine through YouTube. Tubby lives down at the bottom of the sound spectrum. Where a given note sits on the spectrum is measured with hertz. Lower numbers sound lower, higher numbers sound higher. So if I tell you Tubby the Dwarf lives around 80 hertz, that's a sound wave that goes wub wub 80 times per second, which you might not hear very well if you're listening on crap speakers because it's super low. So how do you keep Tubby from exploding your bass? It's simple, but a bit counterintuitive because your amp has a bass knob, which you probably don't want to turn down because this is a bass and that says bass and we play bass, but actually cutting that knob can take a big bite out of Tubby's territory, reducing those rumbles and making more space for that kick drum. On this Fender Rumble amp or any amp with a basic three or four knob EQ, that means turning this rumbly mess, holy crap, into something much more manageable, but still full sounding. Or on an amp with a graphic EQ, like this high-end Dark Glass Microtubes 900 version two that I bought because Tim Lefebvre said they were cool, the leftmost slider will affect the rumbles. So super rumbly, shaking the stage, bad things, just slide that down. And I've still got bottom, but it's not exploding anything. But like I said, these dwarves don't just cause problems. If you master them through a mix of boosting their sound and limiting the other dwarves, you can unlock cool, specific tones that help you mimic your favorite bassists. Like the king of tubby himself, the legendary James Jamerson, who played on most of your favorite Motown hits. Check out the tubtastic bass tone on Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. See how that 80 to maybe 120 hertz range is dominating the sound. Rolling the tone knob all the way down on your bass gets you close to that sound, and then boost the bass knob on your amp, reduce other stuff to taste, and without any of the right gear, you can get close to that girthy sound just with the powers of Tubby. That sound is awesome for copying Jamerson, but try that same tone on a Tool song, and Maynard will have you in a headlock quicker than you can say enema. That's why you need the other four dwarves so you can tailor the perfect tone for your song or style. Cause you've tamed the bottom frequencies of Tubby the Dwarf, the drummer's counting off the band, and you can't even tell what notes you're playing. Just a big boomy mess of bassy somethingness. That's Muddy the Dwarf making a hot mess out of your tone. Muddy lives in the ballpark of 250 hertz, which isolated sounds like this. You're trying to play a tasty, intricate bass line, Muddy the Dwarf messes with you, the notes all mush together into a boomy bass explosion. 
Once you know how to tame Muddy, he can actually become one of your best friends. Need your tone more clear and less muddy? And just roll that knob down and that's what you get. But if your tone ends up feeling thin and lacking a feeling of fullness, you can actually add in a little bit more quote unquote mud to get a fuller feeling bass line. And on the dark glass, there's a slider right at 250 to get the same job done. So we're super muddy. We dial that down. And the notes are much clearer with less mud. And any control in that ballpark will do the same job. That listed number is just the center frequency, but it affects the whole mud zone. And if you don't have a low mid knob or a slider around there, that bass knob we tweaked for Tubby will also help with Muddy in a pinch. Every good bass tone ever had to make friends with Muddy and find the right balance. Take John McVie's kick-ass tone on Rhiannon by Fleetwood Mac. Add too much of this frequency and it makes a muddy mess in the whole song. Pull too much out and it sounds weirdly hollow, like it's not filling the space the bass is supposed to fill. Like that empty feeling you get when you're not subscribed to Bass Buzz, you sad sap. And don't think you can get good bass tone just by nailing these first two dwarves. The fact that we play mostly low notes as bassists doesn't protect you from the higher frequencies of the next three dwarves. Because as all engineers know, when you play something like your low E string, you're not just playing the one frequency that string is tuned to, there's a whole range of frequencies, as you can see here, that make up your tone. So that's why all the dwarves have the power to destroy your tone, no matter what notes you're playing. Like this, the most elusive of the dwarf problems. Your low end is okay, no rumbles, but you just can't shake the feeling that your bass sounds like you're blowing your nose. That's Honky the Dwarf, highlighting the unpleasant nasal quality of your bass. Honky hovers around 500 hertz, which sounds like this by itself. You want your bass sounding nice and solid like this. <laughs> But if Honky the Dwarf has his way with you, you get the business end of a pissed off goose. So how do you fix it? No, you don't need a frickin' new bass. I printed this out just to show you the horrible things I found on the internet when I was researching tone. I've heard it said that in the under $800 range, most basses have a kind of honk to them, but I was wondering if the condition is terminal, buy a new bass, or if there's hope for the financially challenged. I mean, this just pisses me off so much, and that's why I'm making this video to show you that you can get a professional killer tone out of basically any gear if you know how to tame these dwarves. On the dark glass, the solution is simple. Just push down that 500 hertz slider. So we're super honky. Somebody get this bass a tissue, push that down, and it feels a lot more balanced. But not every amp has a control in that range. This low mid knob is at 280, which is in Muddy the Dwarf territory, and the high mid knob is at 1200, which is way outside of Honky's territory. So is this the moment when you need to buy new gear? Is Honky the Dwarf about to get the best of you? Well, hold on, we might be able to fix this honk yet. So here's the honk. Yuck. What about this contour switch, which will give a big cut at 670 hertz, and then maybe a little cut in the low mids. And it's not a perfect fix, but it's enough to probably de-honk you in whatever room or situation you're dealing with. And frankly, there's almost never a reason you actually need to buy more bass stuff, unless I tell you to. So go buy my Beginner to Badass course, a 30 plus hour step-by-step -step curriculum that'll take you from beginner to, you know. And Honky the Dwarf's not just here to cause problems. Harness his true power and he becomes Growly the Dwarf, helping you get tasty, growly, snarly bass tones. And who snarls better than Iron Maiden's Steve Harris? Check out the powerful growl on a track like Power Slave. Notice how much activity there is in this 500 hertz zone. And compare that to me playing the same riff on my jazz bass, there's a lot less energy there. Putting a boost at 500 hertz helps makes the sound a bit more like Steve. But it's still not cutting the mustard, as they say in the sandwich industry. There's another trick you can use to get more growl out of almost any bass, which is just to use the neck pickup. On the precision bass Steve played originally, that's your only choice. And if I balance to only that pickup on this jazz bass, I can get a similar sound. And you can see how it dials up the volume in that 500 hertz range. And now with the neck pickup in charge and a boost at 500 hertz for some extra growl, it's hi-ho, off to Steve Harris tone we go. 
but it still doesn't sound exactly like Steve, right? Otherwise, I'd be out on the road with Maiden and not sitting here. Because tone is like Fleetwood Mac. It's all about the chain. The tone chain starts with your fingers, and then your strings, and your pickups, some other little things, but EQ, the shorthand term for mastering the dwarves, has a special power because it comes last at the end of the chain. You can take a great bass tone like Steve Harris's brutally clacky P bass that cuts through Maiden's mix like a knife, amazing fingers, perfect strings, pickups, amp settings, but stick some crap EQ on it at the end, and it's a muffled blob you'd never be able to hear in the song. And the thing is, that other stuff, technique, strings, pickups, gets talked about all the time, but these dwarves rarely get a mention, even though they have the power to solve so many tone problems. Say your band wants to mellow things out and play one of their classic slow numbers, but heads turn as your bass enters and your overly aggressive tone bites horrifically through the song. That's Bitey the Dwarf baring his teeth and sharpening the sound of your bass to a point. Bitey lives at around 1500 hertz, or 1.5k, which sounds like this. You might be aiming for a round, mellow tone, but if Bitey the Dwarf gets out of control, your tone will be way too harsh and give the wrong vibe for the song. Luckily, the high mids knob is your friend here. On the rumble, that's centered at 1.2k, which is close enough to take this Bitey mess just no good, and take that down to something more manageable. And on the dark glass, there's a slider right at 1.5k, because they know what they're doing. So way too bitey. Yikes, push that down. Way mellower. Failing either of those options, rolling your passive tone knob down maybe like 20%, should get you out of bitey jail. But don't overdo it if you're trying to clean up your tone before the band starts playing. What sounds too bitey in isolation might work okay with the other instruments in the mix. And nobody knows this better than the bite master himself, Getty Lee of Rush. Check out the nasty bite on a track like Closer to the Heart. Notice all that action around 1.5K. Here's me playing the same riff with everything flat. It's not nearly as cutting, which isn't as exciting for this song. Because tone is about the chain, fingers, strings, pickups, and EQ, and I need to make sure these strings are fresh, not dead, if I really want that Getty zing. So with some fresh strings, the right clacky plucking technique, and a boost to Bitey the Dwarf, I've got a pretty good Getty vibe going. <laughs> And with tubby, muddy, honky, and bitey all on your team, your tone is almost safe from dwarf mischief. But despite your best efforts, you look at the rest of the band's faces when you play, and they're still cringing. Because Edgy the Dwarf will erode all the good work you've done with your tone and add an unlistenable top end. Edgy sets up camp around 3000 Hertz, or 3K, which sounds like this. You're aiming for a solid, warm tone on something like Santeria. <laughs> But let Edgy the Dwarf loose, and your mess of a tone will make the audience cringe. You might think your treble knob would easily save the day, but on the rumble, that knob is centered at 10K, which frankly is kind of ridiculously high for a bass EQ knob. So it'll take away some of the hiss on top, but it doesn't really fix the clank. In this dark glass, we have much more useful controls on the top end. There's a slider at 3K that'll handle the clankiness. Clank, clankity clank, that's so disgusting. So the attack is better now, but there's still some like clicky, hissy stuff on top. And just listen to what happens with this slider. Hiss, no hiss. That's 5K and above. So that's still in the edgy range, but it's going up towards the top. We take that down too. Much mellower tone. Now, if you don't have all of these knobs, you might be able to get a similar effect using your passive tone knob. Make that less nasty. But Edgy the Dwarf could be your best friend if you need the intensity and clarity of tone required by someone like Tim Comerford of Rage Against the Machine. Check out his brutal clean tone on Bomb Track. Look at how much action there is in that 3 to 5K range, giving that clear metallic sound on top of the low end. 
So again, with nice fresh strings for maximum high end to hand over to Edgy the Dwarf, plus some nudges to the high mids and treble, I can get some Tim-tastic edginess. Edgy can also take you into modern metal, like the edgy-ass tone you hear from Adam Nolly Get Good of Periphery. To get all the way there, you can play with a pick, which compared to fingers, has a lot more action in this bitey, edgy range. Plus, you'll need to kick on the right distortion, right basically meaning a dark glass. This video is not sponsored by dark glass, they just make good things. If this video was sponsored, it would probably be sponsored by that awesome beginner to badass course I keep hearing about over at BassBuzz.com, but this video is not sponsored. So with a pick, fresh strings, tasty distortion, and a nod to Edgy the Dwarf, I can sort of imitate Nolly's tone, except that I don't have a low A, and I don't know how to play the hard parts. <laughs> Okay, no, I'm not learning any more of the song. That's enough, I did good. I really can't believe that nobody ever talks about these dwarves. And even after 20 years of playing and teaching, I still learned a lot myself while researching this video. There's so many things I would do differently if I could learn bass all over again. So click on this video and learn what I would do differently so you can avoid my dumb mistakes. And I'm gonna try to play this periphery riff again. <laughs> Oh, that's hard. <laughs>